Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Oscar Diane. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm a senior here at Bentley majoring in finance. Now, instead of me giving you a full elevator speech, let me take a moment and describe the circumstances that led us to this moment. I was in a conference in Atlanta in June of last year, where I attended a session on healthcare reform and innovation. One of the speakers was so impressive. That speaker is here today, Mr. Stephen Bonner. After his speech concluded, I reached out to him, and fortunately for all of us, he was kind enough to free up some time from his busy schedule to speak here today. Mr. Bonner served as the CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America for almost 20 years and was renowned as one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare by the, healthcare by the modern healthcare magazine. He's currently an entrepreneur in residence at the Harvard Business School and serves as an advisor to four private equity firms. I can, I can personally assure you that everything you're about to hear today will be very important to both your business acumen and your outlook on healthcare. On behalf of Bentley University, the Center for Integration of Science and Industry, the Valeni Center for Arts and Sciences, and the Health Thought Leadership Network, it is my honor to, introdu to introduce you to Stephen Bonner. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. Good afternoon, everyone. The honest truth is that the really influential speaker that he saw, he couldn't get to come, so he got me to come from that conference uh, instead. Um, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in healthcare, not only in the United States, but globally. And uh, my excitement for this, you'll be able to see and touch and feel and hear. Um, I include you, encourage you to interrogate it as well. Um, this is as much or more your session than it is my session, and so I encourage questions and answers. I'm happy to be interrupted and stop if something provokes you and we can uh, talk. We should have time uh, to cover a fair amount of interest, and in fact, if we don't get through my slides, we get through things that are of interest to you. Uh, that's a better presentation. Uh, we also have a reception afterwards that uh, we want to invite you all to, and we'll have a chance to talk uh, informally there as well. Um, I titled this, and we went back and forth a little bit, but um, to me, you know, the question is, who's the audience and what would be of interest to them? I can talk for hours about what I think is going on in healthcare. We can talk about um, health policy. We can talk about um, health legislation or the lack thereof. We can talk about health regulation. We can talk about drugs. We can talk about medical devices. We can talk about the science of healthcare. I'm a little shaky there, but I'm an avid student of the science of healthcare. Um, we can talk about delivery of healthcare. We can talk about payment for healthcare, um, all of which are under enormous pressures to change. Uh, thank God, I say. Um, and uh, finally, I think really irresistible, irrefutable pressure, um, not pressure that's perfectly rational or that's predictive, predictable, um, but in my opinion, we're in the very early, very early stages of a major transformation of healthcare. And it's a, not just a U.S. phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon. Um, the whole world, every country with people that are working together is struggling with the evolving reality that the gap between supply and demand in healthcare is widening. The demand for healthcare is getting bigger, faster than the supply is. And some of it is driven by pure demographics. Uh, people are living longer than they've ever lived before. Um, also, technology. Uh, people are becoming aware of the fact that there are ways to live good, healthy lives. There are access to care. There are solutions for medical problems that they didn't know existed before. And so their expectation is growing. Um, they're becoming more engaged consumers, and that word and that theme is what I'll keep coming back to, is what I think is really at the core of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going in healthcare. And that's going to be uh, one of the most high leverage transformations that we'll see. The consumer, the expectation of the consumer, and the behavior of the consumer, the tools the consumer has to hold us to a different standard than we've been uh, used to get away with, used to getting away with in healthcare um, globally. And it's not that we don't have good intention, 
Uh, but there are things that we've done with the structure and the financing and decision making in healthcare uh, that have produced what we've got, which is very high cost, very modest quality, and very difficult to access healthcare. And then you, you add to that the um, rapid growth and demand for healthcare, and the stage is set for a major transformation here. And to me, that's good news. And so the question of where will you find your role in the new world of healthcare, I think, has a complete landscape of opportunity and interest uh, for you to pursue if you're interested in healthcare. Um, if you're only interested as a healthcare consumer, which you have to be interested in at least that, um, it's still going to be a very different world than how you think about it, how you navigate it, um, how you access it, what you expect to get, what you're willing to put up with, what you're willing to pay are all going to be very different components to the world that we all live in healthcare. So that's the backdrop on this from my point of view, and um, only you is going to figure out where you will find your role in healthcare. And to the extent that comments here or conversation, discussion, debate, questions are helpful to you, then I encourage you to use this time. Um, I should also say we're supposed to go till 4.30, so we'll discipline that. I'm a huge believer in start on time and end on time. Um, I also get passionate about this stuff, and so ending on time will be a little bit of a challenge. But um, Oscar will keep me on time, right? Okay, yeah, these Brazilians, you know, well, we'll start manana. What, what, what's the rush, right? So um, we, will, we will keep an eye on the time. Let's make sure that we do that. So before I go any further, any key questions or any topics or subjects that you would like to make sure that we spend some time on, on health care? Yeah. The scope of it in developing countries? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We'll just thinking what I'm saying will largely focus on developed countries, but also on developing countries. And I'll, I certainly will touch some of that, but bring us back if we need or want more. Okay. And as I say, this is not a US phenomenon, it's a developed country phenomenon. And there are some fascinating things I'm involved in. Um, three activities in Africa. Um, I've never been to Africa, so I feel a little guilty, but I'm trying to get there. But we're working on trying to create uh, the first cancer treatment center in the northern region of Tanzania. Um, and from my experience, you know, building big cancer hospitals in the U.S., and then you go to Tanzania, and what, you need electricity? We don't have electricity. You need the internet. We don't have that. Roads, we don't have roads. It's just a whole different world, that's what you're suggesting. And then I'm involved with another former student at Harvard who's transforming primary care delivery in Ghana and has a chain of uh, primary care clinics and a couple hospitals that he's opened that um, we're working on there. And then there's one other initiative. So I have a little window of specifics into that part of the world. Um, and you probably will bring some more. So we'll definitely try to uh, push on that. Any other questions? Just out of curiosity, how many of you are actively studying or involved or have any experience in healthcare other than as a consumer? Okay. How many of you have experience as consumers of healthcare? Okay, so we all belong in this room. Let's just accept that for starters. Um, So I've touched on this a little bit. Market forces are driving transformation globally. And I've hit the ones that I think are the most important ones. Um, and I just popped up um, three countries that are somewhat familiar to me that start to offer some compare and contrast um, opportunities to think about uh, this cross-border universal global problem and how we're watching different countries try to come up with and try different solutions. And you hear all healthcare is local, um, which, is, which is true, uh, but there is a global connection that's happening, and so we're opening it up more. But 
Um, we have to remember that the application and delivery of innovation in healthcare has to come through local cultural filters. And something that we do that's attractive and neat for us in the US will not be familiar or welcome in other countries. And so while I'll talk about uh, the global challenge we're facing and I'll talk about some examples and hit some that I think make a lot of sense, uh, the portability of those um, internationally is a different challenge than it is to introduce an iPhone into every country. And even that is not easy. Um, I've watched Russian language people buy an iPhone and adapting that, you know, there are comp complications to it, but um, a medical procedure that's acceptable culturally in the U.S. is completely abhorrent in some other cultures. So I'm just saying as we look at these things cross-culturally, don't skip that fact as you're thinking about healthcare and where we go internationally. So uh, USA, um, probably most familiar to most of us, um, clearly trying to confront uh, this gap between supply and demand in healthcare. And the uh, unfortunate thing in most ways about healthcare is it also becomes very political. And we way have over-politicized healthcare in the US to the point where every healthcare idea right now in Washington needs to get defined as a Republican idea, in which case all the Democrats know to hate it, or a Democratic idea which the Republicans all know to hate it, and that gives us basically government gridlock in healthcare. And I'll talk about that. There's good news and bad news. Uh, at the core of it is Obamacare, um, the Affordable Care Act, and um, in my opinion, and I'll tell you, I'm, uh, I'm a conservative economically. I'm pretty moderate uh, to slightly liberal socially. Um, I think that there is a golden nugget of health policy that is so American in the middle of the Affordable Care Act that it's a tragedy that we've allowed it to become so politicized. Uh, but in my opinion, at the core of the Affordable Care Act, America's looked itself in the mirror and said, we're not sure how we're gonna do it, we're not sure how we're gonna fund it, but we're gonna find a way to make quality health care available to every American at a reasonable cost if they're willing to engage and participate responsibly in the system. And why that leads to repeal and replace and stuff like that, I don't understand. And I've personally talked to the major proponents of that, and I've said that, and it's political stuff that drives them not good health policy. Um, so we're now, you know, several years into it. Um, the forces continue to push away. Uh, costs continue to go up. We've improved insurance. We have more people covered for insurance, uh, but that's another problem. You know, the Affordable Care Act became a conversation about insurance and coverage rather than about really the, the quality of health care. Um, so, how are we going to deal with this with government gridlock? And I'll come back and talk about it. Uh, the European Union is obviously a, a group of 29 countries, or 28, depending upon where you count uh, the UK at the moment. Um, I've done a fair amount of work in the European Union. I serve as a judge on a uh, European Union um, healthcare vertical that's trying to move innovation across all these countries. And uh, what I will tell you is that when it comes to health care in the European Union, there is no union. And you have a great idea and you get it approved uh, regulatorily in Germany. And if you want to put it in the other countries, you've got that to do 28 more times. And they're really struggling to try to figure out why is that efficient and how can we do that. But then you go back to the cultural reality, and there's a lot about the European Union that isn't union either. I mean, you still have different currencies, you have very different languages, you have very different cultures. And so to figure out conceptually, the, if you want the lowest common denominator to regulatory approval of good ideas in healthcare. So we'll agree as a European Union, if an idea can come through these filters, it can go into every country how you create those filters given different cultures and different languages and different currencies is mind-boggling. Um, we're starting in the thing that I'm involved with, with the um, provision of financial resources to healthcare innovators. And what we're saying is that we can cut through some of this by creating a central resource for financing good healthcare ideas from any country. And so uh, there are 
funds are available. They put together a process. They solicited um, business plans and good ideas and budgets. And then we sat in Munich for five days and interviewed the final 30 teams and rated and ranked them, and they're funding those. And so they'll sprinkle uh, funds and good ideas and let them grow organically around. That's just a step in the right direction. But the EU is working on it as well. Um, Switzerland I put up. I think Switzerland is a fascinating country in many ways. Um, maybe not replicable, but um, it has mandatory health insurance. So the, the, the mandate that we fiddle around with in this country is a given. If you're Swiss, you have to have health insurance. And theoretically, you can go to jail if you don't, but if you don't, the government buys it for you and you're charged a penalty. And so 50 million Swiss all have health insurance. Um, if you can't afford health insurance, rather than building a government bureaucracy like Medicaid to try to deliver it and push you into the system, uh, you get uh, three vouchers, one from the federal government, one from the canton, their equivalent of the state, and one from your town. And you go out into the market and you buy your health insurance. And then when you need health care, you go to the hospital and you're treated just like everyone else. There's no Medicaid door. Um, you just go and you're treated like everyone else. And Switzerland is a great example of how I think competition and consumer control uh, drives efficiency and effectiveness and quality into the health care delivery system. And 50 million people, I think they have 65 competitive health insurance companies. Uh, we have four or five in the U.S. for 300 million people. But when you get consumers with money in their pocket and they're out shopping and some want maternity coverage and some don't and some may want some form of uh, drug coverage and some don't, um, you can craft tailored individual policies on a very economically effective basis. There's competition in terms of what the premiums cost. Everybody's covered. Um, Swiss hospitals are very attractive. The satisfaction, delight of uh, Swiss health care con consumers is very high. And uh, I think they spend about 7% of GDP on health care compared to our 18 or 19% where we have uh, a very inefficient delivery and a relatively unhappy consumer. And especially if you get down to uh, Medicaid consumers or VA consumers, the challenge of doing this on a high quality, reasonable cost, uh, good access basis um, for these large populations with the government paying, we don't have a good success story for that yet um, in the U.S. Um, every other country I put, um, as I say, basically are, are, are struggling with the same things. Um, I could have put uh, Singapore up. It's another very interesting example of a uh, country taking on this issue. Again, it may not be replicable or scalable, um, but in uh, Singapore, uh, from the first check that you earn to the last check that you earn, a uh, portion of that goes out of your paycheck and goes into what I would describe as a super 401k health savings account and uh, mortgage savings account. So it's tax advantage. It goes into this account. You control it. You manage it. You figure out how you invest it so it's like our 401k programs and then you can access it for health care costs uh, to buy a home for education and it's intergenerationally transferable so the smarter you live your life the more you accumulate and the more you make available to yourself and to your friends and family and unlike the US where I think we have I think we're approaching uh, a Two trillion dollars of unfunded future liabilities in health care. So it's in the range of a year or so of total GDP um, of Medicare, Medicaid, um, other unfunded health care liabilities. You know, somebody's going to have to pay for that someday, theoretically. It's like the Social Security system. Um, Switzerland and Singapore have none of that. It's a pay as you go system, and it's a combination of individual patients paying and um, the government paying, absorbing some of the delivery costs. And then also the role of the employer tends to be very different than it is in the U.S. And that's worthy of some thought by all of us as health policy 
devotees and advocates as well. And I'll talk about some ideas that occur to me to make Obamacare better. Um, and part of it is, I think, the inefficiency and the cookie cutter and the, you know, take what you get design of, um, of, of uh, employer provided health care plans. And none of that's pejorative, it just is the reality of what we deal with. So, how do we get from here to there? What's really going to drive this quest for better access, better care, better quality? Um, and to me, it's the question of value. How do we design into this human um, ecosystem a much clearer definition of what value is? Uh, because I think all of us, if we know the rules of the game, we can play the game. Um, part of the problem in healthcare is, you know, if we ask somebody how we measure value in a hospital setting, in a clinical setting, um, in a technology setting, in a science setting, there are no really well-defined rules of the road. So it becomes very subjective. And if you have subjective quantifications of value, the market is very sloppy. It won't focus people on devoting resources to delivering value. So how are we going to figure this out? And uh, some of the early things are that we look at are, you know, you go to the hospital and at least you go home with the same disease you came with. You don't go home with a different disease. You didn't come to the hospital to get a new disease. And that's really a metric that people advocate as one way to measure quality in a hospital setting. And to me, you sit back and you say, who's designing this stuff, right? That's your aspiration, to go to a hospital and hope you don't come home with a disease that you didn't have? And yet, they're connecting that to some reimbursement standards. Um, you know, wash your hands. And there are metrics about washing. I mean, we know that washing your hands in a hospital healthcare setting is a hugely influential component of a quality healthcare experience of not spreading germs and so forth. Uh, but again, we want to pay for that. You know, we want to connect reimbursement to the degree to which people in an institution are washing their hands. Um, don't come back too soon. That's literally a standard in uh, Medicare. You know, if you were re readmission rate, so you come, you go home, you're readmitted within a certain period of time, and um, that depresses the amount of reimbursement that the hospital can get. At uh, one level, it makes sense. You know, you come to get well, you go home, you shouldn't have to come back too soon. Uh, but then you get built-in incentives for people to not come back or not be allowed to come back when they need to come back. So does that make sense? Um, and is that really a core value metric that we should be connecting to reimbursement in healthcare? And I say other things occur to me. And um, we mentioned I was the CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America. We we're a consumer, direct to consumer model for healthcare um, built by a uh, son whose mother got uh, terminal cancer who was an international merchant banker who went around the world looking for ideas that could be helpful to his mom. He came back and he had a number of things that uh, he thought were worthy, but he was stopped at her bedside by the FDA and the AMA and the insurance companies. And as she died, he said, boy, it seems like the bureaucrats care a lot more about the bureaucracy than they do about the patient. And so he wanted to create a place that started with the patient and tried to figure out what do they really value and how can we cut away all the bureaucracy and deliver as much as uh, we can to be helpful to them. And it put us in the crosshairs and as a lightning rod of innovation in much of healthcare and much of cancer care. And you can go and look and see how these crazy people were saying you should use nutrition and naturopathic intervention and the psychology of healthcare at the same time you're given cut, burn, and poison treatment. And there's no science behind it. There is science behind it. You know, over a period of time, these things that are very provocative and very disruptive find their way into the mainstream. And how do we do that efficiently? But at least in our world, we always wanted to understand the consumer. What was their experience? What were they expecting? Isn't that really where the real definition of value lies? And we think that it is. Uh, there are other metrics that are important, but we start with speed to care. Um, especially with cancer, you get a diagnosis and then you're told you got to wait three weeks to get the next diagnostic test. 
is that good care? So now you worry and um, you, you hurt your immune system. Um, cancer never works to the advantage, time never works to the advantage of cancer. It never gets better with time. Spontaneous remission may happen once in a while, but that's not helpful. So speed to care, convenience. Um, you call to get help because you have a, a health care problem. Do you get a real human being that can guide you through the experience, or do you get a recording with a tree that's been built by somebody else? You know, what language do you want to talk in? And uh, we're open from here to there, and call back if you don't want. Um, you know, you've got a health care issue that you need somebody to cut through all that who knows something. How convenient do we make it, and how much does that matter to a, to a patient? And also, the economics of these things are much more subtle than I think they've been given credit for. The feeling has been, well, give them a phone tree, you don't have a real person on it, that's more efficient economically. Um, I don't believe that it is. I think that the waste of time for the consumer and the confusion and the cost of building those systems and administering those systems, I think, unravel very quickly in terms of real cost to a, a meaningful healthcare output. If all your goal is to handle a phone call as cheaply as possible, maybe that's one thing, but I don't think that's the standard that we're looking for. Um, access is similar to convenience. Um, you wake up with a symptom, you need to get some information. Can you get it today? And if you need medication, be on it before you get out of bed, or do you have to wait to get an appointment tomorrow, and then you go and you sit in a room with other sick people and wait to see a doctor, and then you get a prescription and then you go to the pharmacy to fill it and all of a sudden the disease is a day or two days ahead of where it was when you first observed it and it could have been dealt with much more efficiently. Outcomes, I think are to us, everything we could see from our patients, they really cared if in their experience with cancer they lived longer than they thought they would um, and that they had a better quality of life than they thought that they might. And again, this gets subjective with cancer. Length of life and quality of life um, are measurable. And there's data that you can work with that is relevant, but not particularly meaningful to an individual patient and can be very misleading to an individual patient. But we should be measuring outcomes. And we measure by uh, the location of the disease and the stage of the disease. And we published our outcomes compared to a national database um, on length of life and also quality of life, uh, which we measured. Again, this is wild, wild west metrics. There is no standard measurement, and we offered with the other big cancer centers, you know, let's do this together. Let's build one set of metrics, and we can all evolve over time, and we can compete with each other and see the data. And I made that offer to the CEOs, and eyeball to eyeball, they'd say, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Here's my card. Give me a call. And then I get the phone tree, right? Never get a call back. And so we published our data, and we were a lightning rod. Uh, uh, Reuters reporter, who we knew was writing a, a scathing story, and I called and I talked to her, and I said, come and look. Come and talk to our patients, understand really how this works. And she said, I don't need to do that. I've got the data. And she went after the size of our of our database, and we're small, so our ends are small, and we revealed that, and um, trying to measure this is complicated, too, when you have patients with late-stage complex cancer who may have six or seven different morbidities, comorbidities, you know, how do you really measure? And so we revealed that we tried to, or we began with the simplest cases and published data for that, and then we could provide data beyond it, uh, but it's very um, provocative um, in healthcare to try to move into this new frontier and figure out what do people really value and then how do we measure it? And most importantly, how can we give people standardized tools and metrics to be able to measure? And people say, healthcare is too complicated. And you say, oh, come on, you know, that's worn out. We got big data. I mean, automobiles are complicated vehicles and yet we all manage to navigate the purchase process and the repair process, and we can get data that we value in terms of different attributes of a vehicle and make a decision and live with the decision. And I don't want to undervalue the complexity of healthcare, 
But I just think too long we've hidden behind the complexity of health care as an excuse for not giving consumers access to the kind of information that will help them be better, smarter consumers. Um, nutrition, uh, the patient experience, whether it's length of life, quality of life, access, whatever, all these things kind of roll into how a patient feels about the experience they're having uh, with the organization that is offering them service. And rolling into that also are their, uh, their freedom to make a decision. If you're told to go somewhere to do something, you have a different attitude than if you evaluate different options and you decide to go somewhere and you engage differently. And if you engage in cancer care, you're going to have a better outcome than if you go and you don't engage, you're frustrated, you're angry. Um, there are all kinds of psychological and um, economic reasons to try to understand the patient experience and to make it as powerful as possible. And I just put valet parking up as uh, uh, not insignificant, but sort of a trivial example of uh, what can really make a difference, though, and you're seeing more and more of the big city centers provide valet parking because parking is a problem, and you've got a health care issue that you need to come to, and now you've got to navigate this whole neighborhood to try to find a place to park. And so we, at our hospitals, you know, you come up, there's a valet there, you walk in, we know who you are. Um, it's a very different uh, kind of an experience than if you're driving all over the city trying to find a place to park, you get to park, it's ridiculously expensive, then you gotta find out where are you going and you have this level of frustration and fatigue before you even get into your patient experience. Why would you want to start your experience with that patient when they're in that place? And the answer is because it costs money to do valet parking, but it comes back in terms of the patient experience, in terms of how they engage, in terms of how they conduct themselves and how they experience their healthcare system. So the big question on who's going to define value is what's important to you, um, certainly as a consumer, but we also worked hard to study our stakeholders, our employees, uh, because we also know that a frustrated healthcare professional is going to, in all likelihood, deliver a frustrating experience for the patient. And so understanding your whole ecosystem and understanding what is valuable to people and how do you make it more effective and more enjoyable is important, especially in this world of trying to squeeze down cost. So everybody's being asked to, to do a little more with a little bit less, and that affects their attitude. Um, so to the extent that we can understand that and make it as efficient as possible, and we know that in cancer care, more important to professionals than the amount that they're paid, which is important, is do they have the right tools to do their job? Do they have the best technology? Do they have the best talent around them? Are they able to cobble something together for a patient that really gives them a chance at a longer life and a better quality of life and a better patient experience? That's very uplifting and great um, psychic income for people in a, in a cancer setting. You know, do we think like that? as we run these organizations um, and do we take the time to make the investments that come back to you in both hard and soft ways um, with that basic question of how do you define uh, value. So if you <clears throat> start with that question of value, if you start with the consumer at the center of the healthcare experience, then um, you go to uh, this next question, or I went to the next question, I don't know where you go, but I went to this question, so go with me. Um, the consumer's role in the transformation. Uh, what is the consumer's role in healthcare? And I mentioned before, I think largely it's been a very truncated um, and very limited role. Um, we talk about employer provided health insurance, which is now about 60 years old. They probably all know this, but this was conceived during World War II when um, a large part of the population was off fighting the war and yet the economic engine was crunching along very actively and we needed more workers. And so they imposed wage and price controls because they didn't want to drive inflation through the roof by letting employers just compete all the way out on wages and prices to get the limited workers that were available. <clears throat> so 
An employer came up with the idea, if I can't compete on wage and price, maybe I can do something with my benefits program that will make me more appealing, and came up with this idea, I'll provide uh, health coverage. And coming out of the war, the government really liked it, and so they said, well, we like that, so let's put a tax incentive in place. And if you're an employer and you provide health insurance to your employees, you can deduct the cost of providing that health insurance um, from your income taxes. And that's what we've been doing for many years. And uh, health, the um, employer became the primary consumer. You know, who are you going to buy health care from? What are you going to pay for it? Uh, where can you go for coverage? Uh, how much do you have to pay for your part of it? What's the employer willing to pay? Um, all of that, we kind of fell underneath the umbrella of our employers. And that's what has created much of the delivery system that we have today. And I think it also takes us back to what I think is a fundamental of efficient markets, which are uh, grounded in the reality that the only way you get efficient markets is to have a well-informed and empowered consumer defining and driving the market with their behavior. What do they want? What are they willing to pay for? Where do they want to get it? And then the whole market has to respond to that. And I compete with you based upon what I know my consumer wants. And if you're beating me, I'm going to study you. I'm going to figure out how are you doing it better than I am, and I'm going to get better, and markets get more and more efficient and more and more effective. And you can, sure. So the question is, the U.S. is an oligopoly in healthcare. Um, can it get more efficient with better information? Is that? Can it, can it follow a more competitive market structure? Can, can it, yes, okay. So it is an oligopoly. In fact, in my, in my mind, it's a series of oligopolies. You have the big drug companies are an oligopoly. Uh, the, the insurance companies are an oligopoly. And, and shrinking, you know, more and more. Uh, are combining with each other. We're down to four or five health insurance companies. And the big health care providers are an oligopoly, and now they're conspiring with the big insurance companies to become both uh, controllers of where you go for your care, what you get, and how it's going to get paid for. Um, so that's what, that is what we're dealing with, and the big employers also are very intriguing. And as a quick aside, we saw the announcement a couple weeks ago that J.P. Morgan and Amazon and uh, Berkshire Hathaway are going to combine to figure this out. And I say, great, but sounds like another oligopoly to me. I mean, big employers, but we need change. We need uh, disruption. If they want to bring it, let them bring it. Uh, but you, you have your finger, in my opinion, on the critical transformational um, issue which is, can we provide information that consumers want and give them enough authority and running room to be able to drive this to a much healthier industry? And I believe that not only can we, uh, but I think we are, and I think we will, um, against a lot of huge forces, including the forces of this oligopoly. And I'll, I'll uh, jump ahead. Um, here, because it is a perfect place to take the point. Um, another unintended consequence of the Affordable Care Act was that uh, we have dramatically increased the role of the consumer in making the front end payment for their care. So higher deductibles and higher co-pays. And um, it's up dramatically. Um, we also have not done much in this country to increase wages over time. And so we're not only asking them to pay more, but we're asking them to pay a higher percent of the wages that they actually have in their pocket to access health care. And then we're also using the oligopoly to tell them drugs that they can have and where they can go for care. And um, then on a parallel track, we've got a lot of technology developing in other industries that's starting to find its way into uh, health care as well. And so this is absolutely inevitable from my point of view. Let me mention a book in a second called The Inevitable. Um, 
And so we see uh, grassroots innovation starting to happen. We watch as people, especially of the generation that's grown up with this technology, who are used to getting the information they want for every important decision in their lives. They get what they want, they analyze it, they make their decision, they implement it, they pay for it, and they go on. And then they come into healthcare as students or as consumers, and they look around for that information and they say, what on earth have you people done to this industry? This may be the most human industry in the world, and yet we haven't configured information that allow us to look at your own value equation and decide how you want to navigate, what do you want to see, where do you want to go, where are you going to get your health care. And I see him more and more and more saying, ah, uh -uh, not in my life. You're not going to run my life that way. And so they're starting to uh, make some changes. And uh, let me just see here. I'll just do it. I'll do it here. So um, the next bullet is reconnecting the payment to the consumer. So you have high deductible health plans. You've got co-pays, reimbursements. These economic forces are pushing on, on uh, patients. And then their expectations are for better information. They want to know what their options are for care. They don't want just one option. That's not the way they live their lives, especially when the option that they're given says wait a few days, you know, wait a few hours, get in line, hope for the best. Um, they want convenience, they want access, and they want accountability. And so the, the transformation is clearly uh, beginning to happen. The next slide talks about government's gridlock, which is another factor in this. So those factors are all at work, but then you also have the government with this promise that we're going to get more affordable care available to more people, better price and more conveniently, and they're not living that promise. So the consumer's sitting there saying, okay, so this is my industry, this is my health, I'm accountable for it, I'm going to take control. And so I just put a few examples of the kind of innovation that is happening to try to cut through all this and begin to equip consumers uh, with control, with access, uh, with information. And um, information and options, I put down Amino, CellWorks, Cancer Wave, and Health Engine. Uh, just quickly, um, Health Engine, take Health Engine. So you go to your healthcare provider and they say, you need uh, an MRI. And they say, good news, we happen to have an MRI machine available for you two weeks from Thursday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we'll get you an MRI. Going to cost three thousand bucks. Your copay is a thousand dollars. Be here. So now you're sentenced to two weeks of wondering about your disease, waiting, and have only one place to go. So go home, go on your internet, um, and look at Health Engine. And you go on their consumer-facing website, and you say, "I'm Oscar. I'm in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. I need an MRI. Um, I'm prepared to go 25 miles." Uh, my health insurance company is Blue Cross. What do you got for me? And they find uh, in their database, well, there's a specialty MRI clinic um, in Belmont. They have a slot open this afternoon at 2 o'clock. If you'll take it, uh, they'll do your MRI for you for 2000 bucks. Your copay will be 500 bucks. Whoa, options. Better price, quicker access, same technology, and they'll send the report back to your doctor. So... Rational consumer, they go, Oscar goes, he gets his MRI, sends it back to Health Engine. Health Engine sits down and sends a letter to Blue Cross and says, Oscar just saved you a thousand bucks. Get out your checkbook and send him a check for 500 bucks. Split it with him. It's real, it's there. These are the kinds of things that will change this industry. And because people, like people in this room, won't just take that two-week-out options when they're worried about their disease. Amino is similar to that. Um, it's more helping you find a physician rather than a procedure. Uh, but you go in, you tell them who you are, what you're looking for, what specialty you're looking for, and then they'll array for you in order of experience and your criteria, the physicians that are available. And if you want, they'll also help you make an appointment with the physician that you select. And they're trying to 
cut through all the data to also give to you quality, not just volume of experience with what you're looking for, but quality metrics, back to that issue, and price. So out of network, your choice, your information, good data, available data, starts to change the industry. Cell works cancer wave I won't talk about, then I, I, I put scientific innovation, which is, I think, developing at a really accelerating pace um, to all of our benefit. Delivery is a little bit different, but scientific innovation um, on devices, I put Neximetry, uh, anti-cancer PDOX, Pirouette Medical, Gel for Med, all these have websites if you want to look, but um, the point is that how we've made scientific innovation to consumers and when we've made it available to them has also been at the end of a big bureaucratic trail. And there's good reason for the bureaucracy. There's a role for somebody to look and make sure that uh, innovations come through some screens that are helpful, uh, but they should be helpful. And from a cancer point of view, the FDA gold standard process for uh, approving a therapy for a given patient is antiquated. It's worn out, it's broken, it doesn't work. And the gold standard there is based upon large population, placebo-controlled, double-blind, and longitudinal studies that determine what drug got the best tumor response in this large population. And then that's what you're recommended. Go to any cancer treatment center in the country. That's what you're recommended to get. Any insurance company will pay for it. And then as a in improvingly informed consumer, you say, well, why should I get that? And they say, because the FDA approved it for your form of cancer. You know, you have pancreatic cancer. This did better than anything else. So you say, what does that mean? How well did it do? I say, well, if people with primary pancreatic cancer, this drug got a 35% positive response. And nothing else came close to that. So then you say, well, am I in the 35 or the 65? And they say, well, that's why we're going to give it to you. And if your hair falls out, you get mouse sores, your tumors grow, we'll figure out you're in the 65. And then we'll go back in the population and we'll look at the 10% responses and the 5% responses because something there might be more relevant to you. And so the question is, can't we go there first? You know, isn't there a way to figure out 6535 before we give you these drugs? And with the innovation, with mapping the gene and genomic and genetic observation, uh, we're really quite good already at being able to make a judgment on whether you're in the 65 or the 35. And we'll say, no, you're in the 65. So it would be inappropriate for us to give you that drug and to ask the insurance company to pay for it. So we've just saved eight weeks of your life where you're going to get drugs that are poison, that are going to give you a negative effect, and we've saved 80,000 bucks for the insurance company. So now we go back into the database and we look and we say, can we look at things about your ge genetic makeup that look like some of the other populations and give us a better chance at um, connecting you with the therapy that's going to be helpful to you? And we're getting <clears throat> better and better at that. We're not uh, where we want to be. Um, but we can see that in your case, where you're, you have primary tumors in your pancreas, at a cellular level, they actually look more like a melanoma than they do like typical uh, pancreatic cancer. We don't know why your tumor showed up first in your, in your pancreas, but we can see that you're going to get a much better chance if we give you a melanoma, a drug that's been approved for melanoma. So that's not FDA approved, um, not double-blind and studied for that, but it is for other purposes. So. We go to the FDA and we say, here's the science. Can we have approval to give this patient this drug that looks like it's going to work? And the FDA is working at this, becoming much more flexible, and they'll say generally yes. So then we go to the insurance company and we say, FDA approved, will you pay for it? And they say no. It's not been through a large population, placebo-controlled, double-blinded, longitudinal study, so we won't pay for it. And we say, but we just saved you 80000 bucks." This is a real human being, you know. Shouldn't we work together to give this patient a chance to have access to therapy that fits? We also can go to um, we can go to uh, CellWorks, 
which I mentioned, which is a developing company that uh, takes genetic genomic input from individual patients and has a huge, large data capability to project based upon that cellular data what drugs they're, or drug stimuli they're likely to respond to. And they've also embedded the entire database of FDA-approved drugs so they can look across that database by your genetic makeup. And even if it hasn't been tested for cancer, they can say these three or four drugs look like they're the best chance of giving you the therapy that you want. And then um, I have anti-cancer PDOCs, <clears throat> which then allows us, if we want, to go into the lab and expose those four or five high, high potential drugs to your cells and see what actually your cells respond to better than anything else. And uh, anti-cancer PDOX is a fascinating um, laboratory um, technique where uh, they, you, they work with um, specially bred immune suppressed nude mice uh, who are bred so that they have no T cells. So they have no immune system of their own. And this company extracts cells from the patient and then goes in and microsurgically implants the cells in exactly the same location in the mouse as they were in the patient. So, I mean, this boggles my mind, but imagine implanting cancer cells in the ovaries of a mouse. But the results so far, these, these mice very rapidly grow cells, and they're not mouse cells, they're patient cells. And we've known, we've tried to do um, chemosensitivity testing in the lab before, but we've never been able to get enough cells. Now we can grow more cells. So the, just saying that there are things going on that the regulatory approval process is having a hard time keeping up with, but guess what patients are saying? And patients are saying, you know, I've got this cancer. Ten years from now, you're going to finish a study. I won't be here. And I should be informed. I know that there's risk involved in all of this, and I should have a right to decide and a right to control, and there's right to decide legislation that we also help to create to give patients um, the ability to say, I have a life-threatening disease, I've tried the standard therapies, they don't work, I've been informed of some new therapies that are promising, they're through at least phase one trials, um, I'm prepared to sign a waiver, we won't sue, and I would like to try that therapy. And why should they not have the right to do that? It's their life. And by the way, we're also accelerating the research on this uh, new innovation because you'll have a real live patient um, who utilizes it and you can see what they do and how they do it. Um, there are struggles here in terms of eff efficacy and, and uh, effectiveness and so forth, but um, in my mind, it's more connected with the, uh, with the individual. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, I added uh, control and accountability, prices, care delivery. All these things are relevant to patients, and all these things are going to be imposed or encouraged on us as a part of the right to uh, embrace a particular patient and provide them with care that, uh, uh, that they value. And that gets at the oligopoly. That starts to disrupt all that. You know, the, Drug development in this country is so laudable in so many ways, but just so crazy in so many other ways. It's so expensive, and the pricing of drugs is unbelievable. I didn't, oh, I did put Pirouette Medical here. You might want to, if you want, to take a peek at that. That's a completely disruptive new EpiPen technology, epinephrine injection technology, um, that again gets at several flaws in that, and we've all seen the EpiPen pricing uh, controversy in the last year or so. Um, the best information I have is that it costs less than five bucks to make an EpiPen, and the retail price was forced back down to about $600 uh, for a pair of EpiPens when they went to $700. And uh, the, the dominant manufacturer appeared in front of Congress and went through all of the way the market works to scrape money off to pharmacy benefit managers, to retail delivery systems, et cetera, and 
try to say that they're making, you know, 55% margin on a $5 development when it costs the consumer 600 bucks. How does that withstand anybody's scrutiny? And there are reasons why, you know, again, it's so expensive to develop a drug and there's so many failures in drugs and all that, so it just begs for this kind of discipline. And um, Pirouette Medical, there happen to be uh, three guys at MIT that I'm working with that uh, are probably in the next year going to offer a completely redesigned device that gets at a lot of other issues and I think we can do it at a much lower price as well. And it's uh, epinephrine is temperature, and se is temperature sensitive, so if you leave your EpiPen in the glove compartment in the summer and you go to use it, it may not be as functional as you want. This has got a special insulation. Um, EpiPen technology, you know, it's a jabbing technique and it's under pressure and it's a symmetrical device. People have reversed it and they inject all the epinephrine into their thumb instead of into their leg and then they get permanent white thumb. It impairs the um, circulation. You can go it at an angle and bend the needle and do damage uh, removing it. Also, um, a lot of um, young consumers don't like to be seen in a public place with this big violent activity, so they'll wait to get somewhere. Um, the EpiPen doesn't fit in a lot of the evening purses that women like to carry, so they'll leave them at home. Um, this is a hockey puck shaped technology that um, you turn and you just set it on your leg and you push on it so it's not visible. It's much smaller, much more portable. Um, you can't inject it into your hand and um, it should be much less expensive. And it's just another example, and there are tons of these examples where innovators are looking at the way these things function in the market, looking at price, looking at quality, looking at access, and saying, we can do a better job. So I'm very optimistic. I think it'll happen. I wish that the government could be more supportive than it is. I think the government has a very important role to play here, but it's in setting the context for healthcare delivery. It's not in trying to deliver it. Um, just a couple thoughts about how we can get to a better place from here, approving the Affordable Care Act. As I say, I think there's a golden nugget here. I think it deserves legislative attention. I don't think the government should be trying to deliver health care, but I think they should be empowering um, us with financial resources, so health savings accounts, which are uh, um, pretty well tried and true here, but they're very constrained in terms of how much you can do with it. I think means testing is important, and I advocate this for Social Security. The fact that we're all paying for Medicare to be able to provide benefits to Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates and uh, people like that is a complete waste of time and money. They should be contributing to the system, but, but Medicare and Medicaid should be there for people who need it, and we could be much more efficient with uh, how we do it. Insurance portability, health insurance is not easily portable. Tax equity, I talked about the fact that if an employer buys your insurance, they get to de deduct the cost of it, you buy it yourself and you buy it with after-tax dollars. That's ludicrous, it's completely indefensible, especially as we're pushing more people into these individual markets. I just some of these things, even as you know, a conservative, I don't understand how they survive any kind of a rational effort to get to better health care. but then I come back to the fact, why would you expect pure politics to get to a rational behavior? Um, the, the mandate, the individual mandate, I have a different point of view on that than the Republicans. I think that uh, mandate is important. I think that if we're going to provide health care for everybody, we need everybody in the system. Um, we can choose how we engage and so forth, but we can't let young, healthy people opt out of the system in terms of supporting it, and then they can enroll um, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital after the beer truck hits them. It just doesn't make any economic uh, sense. So the last thing I'll offer to you is a book called The Inevitable. I mentioned it before. This is written by Kevin Kelly, who is uh, one of the founders of Wired Magazine. Um, he's been studying the way that we've so dramatically changed um, our ability to capture information, store and share information, and access information and leverage information uh, since the 1970s. And his first chapter is just a really provocative look back. You people haven't lived it, you know, I've lived it. And just to remember where we were and then look at where we've come and some of the resistance you've seen, it's just a really neat first chapter. 
Uh, but then he says that the human psyche, when it goes through this much change, kind of assumes that there's not that much left, that we've probably done about as much as we can do. And he said, we haven't seen anything yet. And then he's got 12 chapters on inevitable trends that are already underway. So that's why it's called the inevitable. And the first chapter is on machine learning and, um, and big data, artificial intelligence. And he says, basically, any industry business you're in, if you add this to your business, you have a whole new business. And that's healthcare to me. And I'm a healthcare nut, so I didn't want to read the whole book. I went right to the appendix to dig out all the healthcare stuff. And there are only about five references to healthcare in the whole damn book. So it reminds us, you know, how much of this lies in front of us. If we can just get good and smart at adapting and adopting for healthcare the things that we've used to transform these other industries, to provide better quality, better information, better cost, better access, we can go from 19% of GDP to something dramatically less than that. So that's my, um, uh-oh, 63-minute overview. I know we owe you a uh, reception. I hope you'll all join us. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for questions. I thank you for those who did, but we've got a whole hour. Or is it good till midnight? Is that the reception till midnight? <laughs> huh? 1, 1 a.m., 1 a.m., okay. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and conversation. So um, please join us at Danielson for um, foods and beverages right now. Um, I want to thank again um, for all of those who made this event possible, and especially to Mr. Bonner for the very enlightening speech. Thank you. Thank you.